Bat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 4th of the 7th month, which happens to be the 16th of September, 2023, on the Gregorian calendar. And we are continuing with our reading and study of the book of Bereshit, or Genesis. We're currently on chapter 16. Last time we had covered the covenant of the pieces being split, except for the birds, and then the flaming torch and the smoking fire going, or the brand going through the pieces, the covenant of which the father made with his son for the benefit and to Abram, but of which he was not a partaker in any capacity. There was nothing that he had to do to help to fulfill this covenant. So we are currently on chapter 16. And it says, And Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no child, and she had a Mitzrayim servant, or female servant, whose name was Hagar. And we don't see it here in Genesis or Bereshit, but in the book of Yobelim, we find how she acquired this female servant. When they were leaving that area, Abram was given a lot of booty if you will he was gifted by pharaoh and he left with gold silver goods and male and female servants hagar was given to sarah at that time <clears throat> and that was a type and shadow again of the children after their captivity and mistreatment in egypt or mitzrayim if you will they're being given restitution for their mistreatment when Yahuwah had them ask for silver and gold from the inhabitants there. And when they left, they left with silver, gold garments and goods. And also a great multitude or a mixed multitude went with them. Right. And Sarah said to Abram, see, Yahuwah has kept me from bearing children. Please go in to my female servant it might be that I am built up by her. Now, I don't want to cut into this too much, but these are mentioned by Shaul as parables of the covenants of the, the covenant, the seed of promise and the, uh, the covenant in bondage, if you will. Hagar is the first covenant of Mount Sinai in Arabia and her children or her child, Yishmael would be the equivalent of the first covenant believers, those who hear Shema Elohim, right? Yishmael is he will hear, believe, and do that of El, right? He will hear El. But he was also foretold to be like a wild donkey of a man, or as the um, Young's literal translation puts it, a wild ass man which that word for uh, ass was originally a, a donkey, and now it's used for derogatory things. But the word aleph samik, as, right, in the Hebrew is to be stubborn. So it was the, to be stubborn is what scripture talks about, how like a horse or donkey without a bit and bridle and steering them by force and compulsion, they won't come near you. So that was what, the first covenant believers were being equated to, just for some context. But all of that is what is being spoken of right here. So try to keep that in mind as you're reading this. It's foretelling the events that you see happening later on. And as we get to it, Father willing, you can see the, the relationship between them. But it says... Please go into my female servant. It might be that I am built up by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her female servant, the Mitzrayim, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. After Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. And you remember when we went into the Genesis Apocryphon, how it covered that he did three years in the land there, 
went and spent five in Mitzrayim uh, before Sarai was taken. Or something to that effect. And he came back for one or for one and that ended up being 10 years. I'm not getting that right though, but it was mentioned specifically the years of what he did and how, when he went and did it in that one, which was a few weeks ago, we covered that the first hand account of what Abram was writing then. So I'm sorry about that. But if you refer back to the video from a couple weeks ago, that should cover it. It says, and he went into Hagar and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. It's uh, three things Yahuwah hates, and four are an abomination to him, right? But a mistress, or a servant, a female servant who supplants her mistress is one of those things that he hates. And that was typified right here. And you can see... His response to that is not to say, oh, what she chooses to do here isn't said, isn't given as acceptable. He makes her repent, go correct herself, and then benefits the obedience and humility. Just for context, okay? A lot of people don't, we overlook these things, but he's consistent throughout history. And Sarai said to Abram, my wrong be upon you. I gave my female servant into your bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. Let Yahuwah judge between you and me. And Abram said to Sarai, See, your female servant is in your hand. Do to her what is good in your eyes. And Sarai treated her harshly, and she fled from her presence. And the messenger of Yahuwah, this is... Another one, these don't ever say of. The Hebrew that usually denotes of is when you have a yod at the end with the sere vowel points, two dots that are next to each other on a horizontal plane. And that's called this the sere. The zere yod makes the um the a sound like bene Yisrael is the children of. Israel in English. So Melech, Meleke Yahuwah would be the messengers or the messenger of Yahuwah. But you don't see that, at least I've never seen it anytime I ever look at the Hebrew. So in reality, this is saying the Melech Yahuwah or the messenger Yahuwah found her by the spring of water in the wilderness. I found that on some occasions, this is literally speaking of our Mashiach. This occasion possibly being one of them, but you can usually tell because he'll give other context where you can definitely tell it's him based on things that are said later on. For example, when Moshe is speaking to Yahushua in the burning bush, he tells him to remove the sandals off his feet for the, the place that he, in which he stands is kadosh or set apart ground and that very same thing he says to yahushua the son of noon when he looks and sees the the prince of the host of yahuwah's army before him and then he worships him and asks him what to do and that is also our mashiach so the the melech the messenger yahuwah that appears to daniel for example not on every occasion but on one occasion, he appears to him, and when Daniel complains that he's weak, this one just says to him, be strong. And as he says it, so Daniel became strong, and he said, oh, keep speaking to me, for your, your word is giving me strength. Because his very word, what he says, happens. And that is a key, that is what happens with our Mashiach. He's not, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? So, you have to pay attention because not every time that it says that will it be our Mashiach, but on some occasions it absolutely is. And this is just one of the key phrases that you can look for. I really don't know if there was ever a part that said messenger of or and if there's a distinction. There may have been, 
but th as far as I know now, there is not. So we'll just continue. This is, and the messenger of Yahuwah found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to shore, or the way to the bull, which is what that means. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's female servant, where have you come from, and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of Sarai, my mistress. And the messenger of Yahuwah said to her, Return to your mistress and humble yourself under her hand. And the messenger of Yahuwah said to her, I am going to increase your seed greatly, too numerous to be counted. And the messenger of Yahuwah said to her, See, you are conceiving and bearing a son, and shall call his name Yishmael. Or Yishema El. He will hear, believe, and hearken to El. Right? Because Yahuwah has heard your affliction, and he is to be a wild donkey man, his hand against every one, and everyone's hand against him, and dwell over against all his brothers. And when you think about the first covenant believers in the land, it was always that way. Everybody's hand was against them. They were always had enemies from outside, and their hand was against everyone. They were all uh, emphatically against the Gentile paganism, if you will, or those abominations. Even up through and to the time of the Maccabees, where they were subduing the, the peoples all around, the five cities that were taken over by the peoples called the Samaritans were subdued. The Edomites and the Arabians were subdued. And, sub and compelled to either keep the circumcision in laws or leave, right? Not to kill them, though. <laughs> it says, And she called the name of Yahuwah who spoke to her, You are the El who sees. For she said, Even here I have seen him, or I have seen after him who sees me. That is why the well is called Be'ir Lachai Ro'ai, which is the uh, the the well unto the, the. I don't know if this is the life of the shepherd or up to the life of the one I see. I'd have to look at the Hebrew there. It says, "See, it is between Kadesh and the Red." And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Yishmael. And Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Yishmael to Abram. And it came to be when Abram was 99 years old that Yahuwah appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be perfect, and I give my covenant between me and you and shall greatly increase you. Now, right here, I want to point out, Yahuwah appeared to Abram, which means he saw, he saw a figure and called him Yahuwah. But the one he saw said, I am El Shaddai. Now, this is a title for the father. And just as in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you can find some, you can find uh, a part where it says that Moshe at times literally spoke or literally had the voice of Elohim speaking through him. Very literally, our Mashiach was speaking through the mouth of Moshe, but the men were hearing him. In that very same way, because Yahushua was supposed to be like unto Moshe in all things, the Father would sometimes directly speak through him. And this is one instance. Other instances you can see throughout the foretellers and even when he is present with them in the flesh. Okay? So, but its context is key. El Shaddai, the one who is the Almighty, just like El Elyon, the one who is the Most High, 
the Yahuwah in the Shamayim can't be the one who's standing on earth. Right? So there is a distinction. And you can read places like in, in Yeshayahu, just in the book of Isaiah, for example, you'll have sections of scripture talking about Yahuwah, who is before all things and holds all power that apart from him there is no other Elohim, meaning besides him or apart from him there is no other that can be called that. And then you have in the very same book the one saying, you are my witnesses that I am El. Before me there was no El formed, and after me there shall be none. I, even I, am Yahuwah, and apart from me there is no deliverer or savior. That one is speaking of our Mashiach because there was the Father was never formed in any capacity. He's always self existent and perfect. Our Mashiach was born in time, the firstborn of all creation, through whom the Father was pleased to make all things. Right? So you can find the context of these things throughout Scripture. If you pay attention as you read, you'll see it more and more as you go. And when you get to places like the Apostolic Constitutions, the writings of Hippolytus, Irenaeus, or Irenaeus, if you will, um, they freely talk about that. They point out the nuances and differences and go through and show them. So it's not me just making stuff up. The idea that Proverbs 8 is speaking of our Mashiach is spoken of in multiple places. It literally talking about that very, very quoting those very words as being about him. So it's not something that any of this stuff is not something you have to make up for yourself. You can literally find the evidence for it as shared by those that he told us to listen to. And for the record, the Torah and his eternal words were given to the children via Moshe, although there were some words beforehand. And they were foretold that they needed to listen to the one who was like unto Moshe in all things. And that was universally acknowledged, except for by those that rejected him, to be Yahushua Mashiach when he came. He established very clearly 12 and then the 70 of which some fell away. And the ones that he chose and anointed, he said, I'm sending you out. And if they don't listen to you, it will be better for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for them. That's a fact. So their words are paramount to be heard. They established the assemblies throughout the world. They anointed every overseer. They established the apostolic constitutions, and they plainly said, anyone who will not listen to the ones we've put at the heads of the assemblies, which was by unanimous consent of the governed. You got to read how this stuff works. It's literally the common law, how our government in America's functions is how the Torah is supposed to work. And the apostolic constitutions is the same thing. Hallelujah. Yes, brother. Uh, a comment in the chat there says, In Proverbs 8, it speaks of the way, the truth, and the life all in the chapter, which is absolutely accurate and all about our Mashiach, right? You can find that kind of thing in a variety of places as well. But the idea that he was the firstborn of creation and then all things came to be through him, as plainly said in the renewed or new covenant times, it was alluded to and and spoken of in the Proverbs there and plainly shown right there back in Genesis, also in the first chapter of the Good News account of Yahu Hanan, right? And that also ties into the very word for Mashiach, if you recall. I just shared that in the um, other Telegram group, but you can look at that if you want to. Part of the word shiach is discourse or communication to meditate. And mashiach or the means of discourse or communication is the anointed or our Messiah, if you will. Mush, like mush mush or mash mash, 
memshin or memwashin is a word is um touchable touchy filly like mush mushy in english right so mashiach could also be the touchable fillable communication or what we call the word made flesh and you can see that just right there in his in the title that was given to him that's the power in the hebrew language that it really solidifies the validity of the truth you can only ever find confirmation of what's plainly written when you dig into it right but right here after he's 99 years old so 13 years later a significant number for the 13 tribes represented in yishmael if you recall yahuwah appears to him our mashiach appears to him and the father speaks through him but he says i am el shaddai walk before me and be perfect and I give my covenant between me and you and shall greatly increase you. And Abram fell on his face and Elohim spoke with him saying, as for me, look, my covenant is with you and you shall become a father of many nations. And no longer is your name called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham because I shall make you a father of many nations and I shall make you exceedingly fruitful and make nations of you. And kings shall come from you. And I shall establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you in your or in their generations for an everlasting covenant. To be Elohim to you and your seed after you. This is where they get the idea of divine right of kings, but it's perverted by Satan so that only those that are actively serving him are put over positions of authority in the people that he's ruling. He can't change the fact that our creator gave the kingdom to Yahuda and from Yahuda to Zerah, and Ferez, and from Ferez and Zerah to the line of Dawid, specifically. These are unequivocal. These are never to be, never to be annulled. You can read the promises of the perpetual kingdom given to Dawid in the Book of Psalms, in in Shemuel and Chronicles, I believe. These things cannot be repented of. But it doesn't mean that they're going to be walking right. So while Satan can't, he can't create this, he can't change it. He can just kill, steal, and destroy. He corrupts. And that's why, oh, what was it? You look in the early parts of Yeshiyahu, it talks about the kings that are going to be punished throughout the world for the things they're doing. And you can find that very same condemnation and the details for what it is and how they're going to suffer and how they're going to praise him in the, the times they get to come before him, before him being cast away into darkness again, for all the kings, all the landlords and the, the owners and rich men of the earth of Yahuda that's abusing his people because of their lewdness and witchcraft and intoxication through drunkenness as he um, cautioned his children to be careful of what he partook of in his life that was later on passed down, all of it foretelling the future. So, like I said, the promises of our creator cannot be annulled, but Satan has jurisdiction over things that people who willingly submit to him, which is why we have the problems we do in the world. And, in, you know, the fix is repenting. So it says, And I shall give to you and your seed after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I shall be their Elohim. And Elohim said to Abraham, As for you, guard my covenant, you and your seed after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you guard between me and you, and your seed after you. Every male child among you Sorry. 
is to be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall become a sign of the covenant between me and you, and a son of eight days is circumcised by you, every male child in your generations. This son of eight days is foretelling, I'll cover in just a moment, okay? The idea of the eighth day that's talked about, though, is alluded to here. It says, he who is born in your house or bought with silver from any foreigner who is not of your seed, he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your silver has to be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant with an uncircumcised male child, sorry, and an uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, the soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So the physical is meant to teach and explain the spiritual. And this is explained even back in the renew or the original covenant times, where as far back as Deuteronomy, I believe, he tells him to circumcise the foreskin of your heart and your flesh and not turn away from him anymore. All right. And that's the, the spiritual application is to remove the 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 the, the stony heart to circumcise the heart to be penitent and realize that you're open and exposed to the almighty there is no covering of which you can hide behind okay other than our head but that's a, that's a separate thing the idea of the eighth day or the son of eight days being circumcised being a parable there is tying back to the creation account you have the seven days of the creation account where you have the six days in which he labors and then the seventh day rest, the 6,000 years, and then the millennial reign after which Satan is released again to entice those who will to turn away. No one that is of the first resurrection and becomes like the messengers is going to be subjected to that. But everyone who is still mortal, if you will, will be tempted and those that turn apostate will be consumed in fire when the world is burned up. Then we'll have the great white throne judgment for a week of years. And then the renewed creation on the eighth day where they will be circumcised in truth, just like the messengers. And that is what that represents there. Okay. Okay. That's the fullness of it. And this is why men can live in this life literally. They did it before Abraham. They did it after Abraham, even his own children who are not circumcised and yet accepted. Okay? Because it was never about the literal flesh that was to teach you. In 4th Ezra, 490 years before our Mashiach came, he foretold that he was going to do away with it. In the times of, of the children in the wilderness, it was a foreshadowing of his for, of his taking it away later. It was in, with what happened with Yahushua bringing him in to circumcise him again. It was all pro, it was all foretelling. If you have the the inclination to look for it, this is the same way. But this is why when he came and they were going off into the wilderness to build their their assemblies, it was not the time of them being in the land. That was the time when circumcision in the flesh was no longer required. And there was a multitude of reasons, but it was foretold for a long time beforehand for anyone that might be contentious about that point. And just for the record, I was personally circumcised. Most men in America, I think in my generation, it was standard procedure, but it's not something that we should do. And knowing better, we, we should make the right choices for our children. <clears throat> So it says, and a son of eight days is circumcised by you, every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house or bought with the silver from any foreigner who is not of your seed. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your silver has to be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. 
and an uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, the inner being shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And Elohim said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, do not call her name Sarai, for Sarah, or princess, is her name. And I shall barak her, and also give you a son by her. And I shall barak her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples are to be from her. Plural and multiples. Okay, The peoples are always exclusive to the children. Throughout the text and context of scripture, the peoples of Elohim are, the, are those that are in covenant with him, the seed of Abraham specifically, and those sojourning amongst them. And the nations are just that. They're all the nations, both those in covenant or those not. And his seed literally became nations. And Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, is a child born to a man who is a hundred years old? Or is Sarah, who is ninety years old, to bear a child? And Abraham said to Elohim, O oh, let Yishmael live before you. And Elohim said, No, Sarah, your wife, is truly bearing you, or bearing a son to you, and you shall call his name Yitzach, and I shall establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Now, notice how literal this is. This isn't just to everyone who's a descendant of Abraham, which is explained, but specifically to the one son through Sarah, and then from there, from the son, a specific son born from that union, not to all. So the point is there is a literal seed it is a literal succession from, but it is not including all of those born of him. These things are explained by Shaul in the Renewed Covenant times as trying to explain the situation to the people, both Gentiles and lost tribes that he was speaking to. And if you pay careful attention to the, the context of the grammar, which is probably muddled up in most modern English translations, you'll see there's a difference between who he's addressing as us of which the covenants and promises were from those who were of the seed, and then the them of the Gentiles, of the wild branches being grafted in that were not of the natural, of whom the root bears them and not the other way around. So there is distinction in these things. Uh, you can see it pretty clearly when you look at some of the older writings that expound on this, books that were written like... Yahuda's scepter and Yahusuf's birthright, or it's called Judah's scepter and Joseph's birthright. A book that was written, I believe, in 1917. And there's also a two-volume set called The Missing Links that was published in 1901 that it purports to have a thousand proofs of who these people are. But they go over great detail about these things too. I highly recommend it, okay? And Elohim said, No, Sarah, your wife, is truly bearing a son to you, and you shall call his name Yitzach, and I shall establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. And as for Yishmael, I have heard you. See, I shall barak him, and shall make him fruitful, and greatly increase him. He is to bring forth 12 princes because it's a type of what was to come under the original covenant. Ab willing, father willing, that's starting to make sense now, but it'll make more sense as you go through and you learn the history. And it says, And I shall make him a great nation, but my covenant I establish with Yitzhak, whom Sarai is to bear to you at this appointed time next year. A lot of people overlook that, but in the book of Yobelim, he's literally speaking this to him on the third day of the 15th month, of which that's exactly when Yitzhak was born, 
that one year later. Third day of the 15th month. Yes, what we call Shavuot. It's what it's where every covenant was ratified in scripture. No, I mean fifteenth of the third. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. The fifteenth of the third month. I said that backwards. <laughs> Thank I you. I was trying to figure out where 12, 13, and 14 came in. See, oh, there you go. Thank you for catching that. All right. <clears throat> Get my foot out of my mouth. And when he had ended speaking with him, Elohim went up from Abraham. No one has ascended or descended from the Shemaim, but the son of Adam is what our Mashiach freely disclosed to his taught ones. And you'll never find a reference of messengers or anyone else other than Yahushua, who is El Elohim, the word being the one that goes up or comes down from them. Messengers are sent. Hanok was drawn and called, but it was not of his own volition. However, every time our Mashiach ascends or descends, it's of his own volition that he does so. And he is the only one to do so, because that's what he said. You'll find him doing it as Elohim here, he also ascends up in offerings on a variety of occasions with Manoach, with Gideon, um, with with uh, Shemo, uh, Sh Shalomo during the time of uh, Dawid and Shalomo, I believe as well. So he ascends in offerings. He also ascends freely of his own, right, like right here. And also um, when he was with his taught ones in the flesh and they all saw him and the messengers that were there said, this same Yahushua that you see ascending will come back in the same way where every eye will see him. Right? And Abraham took Yishmael, his son, and all those born in his house and all those bought with his silver, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that, that same day. As Elohim told him, and Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised that same day. And all the men of his house, born in the house or bought with silver from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. All right, um, just one moment. All right, continuing here with chapter 18. It says, And Yahuwah appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre, while he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked and saw three men. Elohim is not a man to lie, the father, right? But the Yahuwah who appears as a man, who men have seen, is our Mashiach. So, so he lifted up his or so he lifted his eyes and looked and saw three men standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and bowed himself to the ground and said, Yahuwah. If I have now found favor in your eyes, please do not pass by, or do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, and let me bring a piece of bread and refresh your hearts, and then go on, for this is why you have come to your servant. And they said, Do as you have said. So Abraham ran into the tent to Sarah and said, Hurry, make ready three measures of fine flour, knead it, and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hurried to prepare it. And he took curds and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them. 
and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. And they said to him, Where is Sarah, or where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, See, in the tent. And he said, I shall, I shall certainly return to you according to the time of life. And see, Sarah, your wife, is to have a son. And Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in years, or in age, rather. And Sarah was past the way of women, meaning I, she was no longer having her her monthlies, okay? Or what they call menopause is, right? And Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my master being old too? And Yahuwah said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I truly have a child, since I am old? Is any matter too hard for Yahuwah? At the appointed time, I am going to return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah is to have a son. Yet Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. And the men rose up from there and looked toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to send them away. And Yahuwah said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing, since Abraham is certainly going to become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be baruch, or blessed in him. For I have known him, so that he commands his children and his household after him to guard the way of Yahuwah, to do righteousness and right ruling, so that Yahuwah brings to Abraham what he has spoken to him. I'll, I'll cover more of what we read right here, but just to point out, this is not just about our Mashiach. He's talking about because Abram's going to become a great and mighty nation, and then from that, all nations of the earth shall be Baruch in him. From that nation, specifically because Abram teaches his children to do righteousness and right ruling, so that Yahuwah will bring on Abram what he spoke. The conditions will be met that that will be possible. But it's the whole people, it's the entire nation that would be the Baraka to the world. Something to keep in mind when we're looking to what happened in history. So Zan Yahuwah said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very heavy, I am going down now to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I know. Seeing he foreknows all things. He didn't have to go down to see it. But he's showing us the example of how we are supposed to be. He enjoins that we prove all things and hold fast to what is good, to investigate what we don't know, to examine the things that differ. And he's not inconsistent with himself, so he shows us by example, even though he's omniscient, he knows all these things. The mind of every man is open to our Mashiach. He still shows us the proper way to be. And if he'll do that, then we most certainly shouldn't presume to know what's in the mind of another without asking them. Right. So the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom, but Yahuwah still stood before Abraham. And Abraham drew near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to act in this way to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, does the judge of all the earth not do right? 
genuine question that he's having here. He's read about what is in Hanok, about the benefits to the righteous in these things. And he rightly is asking, what if there's righteous in that city? Certainly that's not going to happen. He just, it was inconceivable for that to be a thing for him. And Yahuwah said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I shall spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, look, please, I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to Yahuwah. Suppose there are five less than the 50 righteous. Would you destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, if I find there 45, I do not destroy it. And he spoke to him again and said, Suppose there are found forty. And he said, I would not do it for the sake of forty. And he said, Let not Yahuwah be displeased, and let me speak. Suppose there are found thirty. And he said, I would not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Look, please. I have taken it upon myself to speak to Yahuwah. Suppose there are found twenty. And he said, I would not destroy it for the sake of twenty. And he said, Let not Yahuwah be displeased, and let me speak only this time. Suppose there are found ten. And he said, I would not destroy it for the sake of ten. That very theme is reiterated in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's in fragments, but it talks about how the promise given that he would not destroy a city if there were 10 righteous found in it is something that's universally true. So you can find an earthquake that wipes out somebody or destroys a, a tsunami that wipes out a, and destroys an entire town. It's not inconsistent with the truth you find right here. Okay, or on that tower that fell that killed the 18 Galileans. It won't happen if there's 10 righteous, that he will not punish the righteous with the wicked. Okay, that very phenomenon is also seen in Second Baruch when Yahuwah commands Baruch to go find the men like him and get them out of the city because he wants to destroy it. And their prayer is like a steadfast wall protecting it. And as he had already told, foretold that the city would be desolate because of what Manasseh had done, he required his righteous men that were in it to leave before he would do the thing that he said. That's encouragement for all of us to find local fellowship, to have true piety. If we want to deliver the city for, for, their, for our sake, that's a requirement, just so you know. All right, um, this last chapter really gets into the meat and potatoes of the Father and Son being revealed, which again, in the Apostolic Constitutions, which is the Constitutions for the Kingdom of our Mashiach, the assemblies that were to be built, given to his emissaries during the 40 days that he was with them before he ascended into the Shamayim. That's what it says within the text. Also, Irenaeus, or Irenaeus, who was a taught one of Polycarp, who was a taught one of Yahukanon, who was a taught one of Yahushua Mashiach, they both go through and talk about how these things are foretelling stuff. Both what we'll see right here and the idea of Abraham being shown the son who was given the father's name appeared as Elohim with men who would wash who you know washing feet and dining with them and to whom the father who's also Yahuwah gave all judgment and authority this is what he sees within this account right here all foretelling the future and of what would come but right here it says chapter 19 and the two messengers came to Sodom in the evening. This would have been the evening of the first day of the fourth month, an appointed time, and also when Yahuwah chose to visit men. Something he does quite often is, is interact on appointed times. It says, And the two messengers came to Sodom in the evening, 
And Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And when Lot saw them, he rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Look, please, my masters, please turn in to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet and rise early and go your way. Hospitality, kindness to strangers, something Clement in his epistle talks about and a requirement for believers to have deliverance and interaction with messengers. If you look at all the accounts where you see hospitality and the interactions with what they call angels or messengers, it goes hand in hand. Tobiah, who's another example, says, and they said, no, but let us spend the night in the open square. Yet he urged them strongly, and they turned into him and came into his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young or both old and young, all the people from every part, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us and let us know them. So Lot went out to them through the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please let, or please, my brothers, do not do evil. Look, please, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you and do to them as you desire. Only do not do no deed to these men, because they have come under the shadow of my roof. Yet they said, Stand back. And they said, This one came in to sojourn, and should he always judge? Now we are going to treat you worse than them. Which is also alluded to when Kepha mentions that he was a righteous one, daily living and hearing about their wickedness and trying to reprove the, the things they were doing and bearing up under grief because of it, right? So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door, but the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with him or with them and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, and they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, a son-in-law, and your sons, and your daughters, and whomever you have in the city? Bring them out of this place, for we are going to destroy this place. Because the cry against them has grown great before the face of Yahuwah, and Yahuwah has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place, for Yahuwah is going to destroy the city. Yet to his sons-in-law he seemed to be as one joking. And when morning dawned, the messengers urged Lot to hurry, saying, Get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he loitered, the men took hold of his hand and his wife's hand and the hands of his two daughters, Yahuwah having compassion on him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. And it came to be, when they had brought them outside, that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be consumed. And Lot said to them, O oh, no, Yahuwah, look, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes. And you have increased your loving kindness, which you have shown me by delivering my life. But I am unable to escape to the mountains, lest calamity overtake me and I die. Look, please, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is small. Please let me escape there, 
is it not a small matter, and let my life be delivered. Now, Ron Wyatt, a gentleman who did a lot of archaeology in the 70s through the 90s, uh, even possibly into the, the, the millennium there, he did a lot of discovery by the favor of our creator and was able to find a lot of the uh, evidence for Noah's Ark, the exodus out of Egypt, the Red Sea crossing, the real Mount Sinai. They've later on found the place where they were making the the uh, the tools and implements, the the smelting furnaces in the wilderness there by Mount Sinai, where they built the things for the 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 tabernacle, have actually been discovered. They've also discovered Sodom and Gomorrah, the five cities that were laid waste, and the little city that was still intact that he fleed to, it was all made known. I don't know how much it's talked about today, but you can still find his videos available on YouTube uh, I, under his name, Ron Wyatt. And there's also, I think there's one called the Ark Chronicles that talks about the Ark of the Covenant specifically and the things that he found in regard to it. But I highly recommend looking at that. You can see the evidence of the, the cities that were destroyed, where they're at and also the one that was left and that it was literally a small city because it was just then being built and they started as little squares and expanded outward. This is, and he said to him, look, I have favored you concerning this word also without overthrowing this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I am not able to do any deed until you arrive there. So the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar, and Yahuwah rained sulfur and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from Yahuwah out of the Shemaim. Meaning, as Irenaeus says, the sun received power and authority from the Father to administer judgment, of which he was he did so. So he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. Yet his wife looked back from behind him and she became a post of salt. And Abraham arose early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before Yahuwah. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the plain, or all the land of the plain. And he looked and saw the smoke of the land, which went up like the smoke of a furnace. For our Elohim is consuming fire. Thus it came to be, when Elohim destroyed the cities of the plain, that Elohim remembered Abraham, and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. And just to show you a little bit of how the common law adapts these things for use, later on, you'll see an example of Dawid, who sends messengers to Hiram, or the son of the king who had died, that was his friend. And the counselors of that new king conspired against him and said that they were spies, so they were humiliated. Their beards were shaved off, their backsides were exposed, and they were ridiculed and sent on their way, to which they returned and, and gave the sad news and then went to Jericho until their beards would grow back so they would not be ashamed to be uh, without facial hair in the land because it was actually commanded for men to do so. It's still a commandment for people in the renewed covenant to not change the way your creator made you and called good whether you're a man and should grow a beard or whether you're a woman and, and not adorning yourself with makeup and changing the appearance that he's given you. It says, And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountains, and his two daughters were with him, for he was afraid to dwell in Zoar, and he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. 
And the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man on the earth to come in to us, as is the way of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine and lie with him, so that we preserve the seed of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. And he was not aware of it when she lay down or when she arose. And it came to be on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, See, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight as well. And you go in and lie with him so that we keep the seed of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night as well. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he was not aware of it when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. And the firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab, literally Ma'ab, or of the father. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. And the younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami, or son of the people. He is the father of the children of Ammon to this day. All right, and um, Ab willing, with the last few weeks of going through this, you can see pretty clearly that there is a Elohim who goes by the, the name above every name, Yahuwah, but that appears and speaks with men. And if you know anything about what it says within the Old Covenant and the New, no one can see the face of the Father and live. No flesh can see him. So this is clearly not the Father that was there. But it is explained that it is our Mashiach. Ob willing, we'll go over those other parts later on. And we've done it before, but you can check them out yourself in the Apostolic Constitutions. And it, the book of Yobelim gives you another inside example of that, where it is our Mashiach speaking to Moshe. And you get the idea that the Father has him doing these things. But thank you all for your time. I don't know if we're going to do the Q&A right here on there or not. So if not, you have a wonderful Shabbat. And we'll see you next time.